Right then, I am here in Texas. It is one week post Oceanside. So this video go out just over a week after the race. And I thought in true Triathlon Ross fashion, I will find an armchair, sit down and give you a bit of a detailed overview of how the race went. So let's start with a few days before the race. Uh, so we flew out to uh, LA on the Monday, drove down to Oceanside Monday afternoon and we had Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So we had four full days to adjust to the time difference, do a few little tune-up sessions and uh, get familiar with the area. Obviously, Billy and Fenella had been there before, which was greatly helpful as we knew where to get coffee, groceries, settle in, where the run course was, all that sort of good stuff. Uh, throughout the week, felt okay. Um, was not sleeping great. M Monday night to Tuesday morning, both Billy and I were up from about three, four. We actually managed to do the first food shop and set all the bikes up by about 6 a.m. Tuesday. <laughs> um, but effectively, I woke up an hour later each day. So next day, five, and then back on schedule, waking up around 6 a.m. Tuesday was a super easy day. Uh, we did an easy run off the top of my head. We went for an easy swim, and we also did a, an hour or so out and back along the coast down towards San Diego. Wednesday, we did our sort of final uh, or day with intensity, hard swim, hard bike, hard run, but very short sessions. Thursday was a day of almost complete rest. We did go for a, a sea swim for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, but it was very choppy and very wavy, quite windy, uh, and it had been raining or there was sort of a storm rolling in. And then Friday before the race, we did our usual sort of 20 minute run, 30 minute bike, an activation type swim and ready to go for race day. So race day itself, um, first of all, it was wicked to be back in a transition where there were 3000 odd athletes. It felt like in European terms, like the Mallorca 70.3, super popular race, full range of spectrum of like people doing it for their first time and people doing it uh, because it's like the biggest and best one in North America as such or the season opener but transition was massive um, and that just filled me personally with more excitement. You know, I like racing against lots of people or, or knowing then the field's gonna be pretty deep. So transition in the morning was, was like a real energy kind of um, boost. Uh, the swim had been changed, which I was slightly disappointed by. So the swim is normally a point to point swim. You start on the beach and you effectively swim out around the harbour wall and back into the harbour. That would have meant a running start and navigating through whatever swell or surf there is. Something um, I think I'm particularly good at being a Cornish lad and sort of surfing as, as a kid and stuff. I know how to duck dive, I know how to dolphin dive, etc. Uh, and obviously some of the swim would have involved running through shallow waters, etc. And slightly less swimming, more running, which would suit my uh, sort of strengths. However, it'd been moved to the harbour. Um, this was due to the sort of weather and, and whatnot. So it's effectively a loop swim. Something that uh, didn't go to plan or I really struggled with is no one could tell me what the swim course was. There weren't any maps up. There weren't any maps on the Ironman website. I sort of knew it was an anti-clockwise loop, but I didn't know sort of how far to each of the boys that you had to turn on your left, which was really annoying because I didn't know roughly which way to aim at and particularly the sort of out to sea and turn in the harbour. You know, even looking at a swim map, you could see the sort of approximate angle you'd be aiming at because with the sun coming up, etc., it was really hard to see. And you didn't know whether you just go straight out or sort of keep it to left or right. So I had to kind of make that up as we went. I did find myself next to most of the boys throughout the swim, uh, both obviously all the turn boys, but they had yellow boys, which you had to sort of aim at. So I don't think I swam necessarily necessarily too much further than you like the course should have been, but it definitely um, disrupted sort of the swim for myself. I had to stop a few times and I sort of learned my lesson from Nice where for some reason my goggles are brilliant in the pool but when I go into open water and I think it's I just need to get a new pair the seals sort of worn on them the left goggle seems to fill with water and in Nice I didn't empty it and I spent an hour with salt water in my eye and I got out of the bike and had a swollen face so I actually stopped three or four times to empty that goggle out. Um, and I can see on my Strava, I think I actually stopped eight times in total, A, for, to see where I was going and B, to empty my goggle. By, by no means would that have made up huge amounts of time, but definitely cost myself sort of 
30 seconds approximately there, um, which is a little bit annoying. Anyhow, got, got out the swim. I was vaguely aware of what I'd swam and I knew it was sort of under 30 minutes just, which was definitely slower than I expected. But with the stop start, with not knowing where I was going, I felt like I swam really hard. I remember thinking to myself, this is definitely harder than Finland, which is the last time I did a 70.3. Although the time I wish was quicker, in my head, I, I kind of executed what I wanted to do, which was I swam pretty hard. You know when you've swam hard because your lats and sort of that are sore getting out the swim, which they're not in a pool necessarily. So that 1900 meters of continuous swimming, you know, I had given it my best and the time is the time. Uh, got out of transition. There weren't a lot of people getting out of the water. So I kind of hoped I was still near the frontish of the race. Um, didn't see, didn't think I'd overtaken many people in transition. Um, the rack, obviously with the lower bib numbers, was still fairly full when I got to my bike, which tends to be where the, you know, the stronger guys and girls are. But got on my bike and, and went to work. The bike overall, I'm super satisfied with uh, and kind of go through a bit more in detail now. The first 30 minutes, I normalized 280 something, average just over 270. So bang on the power I wanted to kind of hold it's sort of not the highest power i've ever put out in a 70.3 but i wanted to feel really controlled on this ride i didn't want to just you know absolutely blitz the bike and then sort of cling on for the run so the first 30 minutes sort of executed that the next 30 minutes i continued at that effort for i think about 15 20 minutes i'd only overtaken i think at that point like two men and I wasn't quite sure whether they were age group men or pro men. I was hoping Race Ranger was going to be used for the pro men because that's how I then differentiate the back of the pro men's field and the age group race. I did overtake a lot of women. Obviously, the pro women started ahead and I was quite surprised at how quickly I caught some of those. So I, it, I didn't know whether I was riding well or not because I hadn't see, a, hadn't seen many boys and B sort of kind of didn't know if the boys I'd seen were actually in the race I was in. Uh, and I was going past them so quickly to some degree, I couldn't even see their bib numbers. They were sort of screwed up or what have you. The last part of that 30 minutes, we had a really, really strong tailwind. And I actually got caught by two guys that I'd previously overtaken. Now, personally, I backed off to about 220, 230 watts for that period. I knew we were going to be on that road for about 10k and we were riding sort of 48, 50k an hour and, and I knew that the hilly part was coming. So I sort of backed off a bit. I didn't expect to be caught but it actually played into my favour really well because the two guys that then caught me were really keen to sort of stay with me. In my head, I think I'd earned their respect because I'd come whizzing past them. They saw me as their sort of ticket to like progress through the bike a bit and therefore they were quite willing to sit on the front and do quite a lot of the work one of them um, I didn't know him but he I think raced for every man jack which is quite a big team out in California and he he looked the more sort of professional of of the two in terms of clearly knew what he was doing so he kind of set the pace and he said to me let's get rid of the other guy so we basically worked together to sort of get rid of the, the other guy for the next sort of hour or so. Now the bike course, after you sort of get to the, the furthest point away from Oceanside, you then go well into this military camp and you get to the sort of two main hills. The first hill is bloody steep. Off the top of my head, I can remember looking on Strava, I think it was about a four minute effort. Now I would have done close to like 380 up there with these two guys and it felt reasonably comfortable. I kind of needed to push really high power with my one by so that I wasn't grinding up so I could stay on top of the gear a little bit. But that was how hard they were going and I wasn't going to let them ride away from me. After that bit, it's quite a big descent and at this point it's where I lost my Garmin um, and it was a bit of a strange one. I could see my Garmin wobbling a little bit and I, I'd been playing with the what shot mount into the bars the day before and I thought, God's sake, I haven't tightened it up enough. And that has come off previously with me. So I started holding onto it between my arms thinking I'm going to have to take this off at some point and just stick it in my suit. I then sit up and it pinged off and it wasn't actually the mount. It was actually the back of the Garmin that clips in. The two little screws had come out and I lost the Garmin. I certainly wasn't gonna stop. Um, I was doing about 70K an hour when it came off. We were proper descending. So that was the end of that, had no numbers. I managed to start my watch so I could record the last hour or so. Um, but yeah, sort of in some ways felt a bit liberated because I could just ride. And I knew I'd been, been with the two guys long enough that I knew they were set at a relatively good pace. So 
ride with them, take my turn on the front if and when applicable. And like, this is fast and hard enough. Um, so that did help. If I was on my own, I think I might have gone a bit too hard, etc. We then got to the main hill. This was about 15 to 18 minutes of effort. Let me look up what we did. Yeah, so on the hill, we did 280. So it actually felt really comfortable. I probably would have gone harder if I A, had my power meter and B, was on my own. And I think I could have made like a bit more, like if I was on my own, I would have ridden faster here, maybe by a minute or so. Um, I can definitely see the middle of the hill. I was only doing 256. Uh, and then the last, the last couple of minutes, I was doing 340. Um, so yeah, it was a bit spiky the hill because of if I caught one of them, I went past them, sat in, etc. After that hill, it's basically pretty downhill and fast to the finish. We managed to get rid of the, the slightly weaker rider on that hill. Um, he actually was very good at going uphill, but not very good at going downhill. So we lost him on the descent there. I went through the speed trap zone. So on the Oceanside course, there's a bit of the, a downhill that you can't go over 25 miles an hour, 40K an hour. Now I went super slow for it because I didn't have my GPS and I didn't know if I was going too fast or not. Went through there really cautiously. They do DQ people that, that go over the speed limit and the guy I was actually riding with who did cross the line, second overall age group, had got DQ'd. Then had the last sort of stretch into transition. Had a really cool moment where uh, one of the Ironman camera crew who'd been following Fennell around all week that we'd got to know, he pulled up alongside on his motor and started filming me a little bit. He did, they did, they did come by, I didn't hear them saying, on your left, and then all of a sudden they were right there and they were very close. I thought, uh, thought that could have been curtains. But yeah, that was quite a cool moment and maybe that will appear in the documentary at the end of the year. Um, sort of triathlon Ross, trying to chase some guy on a bike. Caught some guys late on. I didn't know at the time, but effectively that was the front of the age group race, which uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be really cool if you could know that at some point. But yeah, figured that, figured that we must be near the front because A, we hadn't really caught anyone else and B, you know, I was riding still pretty hard there were some surges to catch those guys on the way back in of well over 300 watts for me just to like get onto the back and have an easier cruise in um, which is what I did I can see for the last hour of the bike a normalized 265 average 245 and yeah there's some pretty big spikes there five minutes at 327 watts half an hour from the end of the bike leg and that was just to get back onto people knowing that I have to do less work on the way in. Rolled into transition, really happy with the ride, thinking basically things are on plan here. Left transition, got a shout early on, I think from I think from Liam Lloyd's girlfriend. She had a brave, was it brave or something, t-shirt on and a big Welsh accent saying that I was fourth overall. Uh, it was like 26 seconds to the front or 26 seconds to third, something like that. And I was pinching myself at that point. The run course was relatively empty as you would expect. I didn't necessarily know if I could win, but I definitely thought, you know, I'm going to be competing here, which is all I've ever dreamed of. First K, 3.45. Second K was like a four minute K. And that was when things started to unravel a bit. I felt something go in my calf. I don't know if go is the right word. I felt something in my calf that didn't feel normal in my left calf. The issues I had over two years ago with calves now all in my right calf. So I've never really felt it in this one. Didn't really know what was going on was was obviously immediately like what about texas i wasn't really then focused on the race i actually stopped and walked for a bit lionel was catching me he would have been sort of maybe a third of the way through the first lap uh, set his second lap sorry uh, and i'd seen that uh, on my way out that he was leading with sam and jackson so i actually stopped and clapped him and sort of walked stretched my calf a little bit it did ease. I took some salt tablets on thinking this is this must be cramp, like it can't be a tear uh, and obviously praying it's not a tear. Managed to get back up and running and basically from then in, I, I said to myself, just you have to finish. I'm, I'll walk it if I need to. But if you could just tap out effectively Ironman effort for the rest of the run, that'll be decent. You'll keep it under 90. Well, my goal in my head there was keep it under 90 minutes for the run. Uh, and yeah, make sure you cross the finishing line. I knew still I was within the top 10 overall. And there is a part of my brain that while you're still in the top 10 overall, you've kind of got to, got to keep racing, if that makes sense. I, you know, if by some miracle I could stay in the top 10, 
with this sort of issue, then that would be be, be amazing. I saw Billy. He almost he was keen for me to stop, or he, he his words were knock it down to Ironman power or or stop, uh, or power sorry effort, and, and I already had. So yeah, basically cruised it a little bit. The calf didn't get any worse. Got to about 12 or 13 k, where you have almost run back to transition and you start your second loop. There was an American guy whose coach kind of pointed at me and said, "That's him there," something like that. And that really motivated me. I didn't think I'd catch him, but um, clearly people were wondering where I was or, or in relation to the age group race, etc. And you know that was the little little bit of focus that I needed then to finish the run fairly strong. I actually negative splitted the run, which I don't think I've ever done in a 70.3. Um, almost did the last 10k under 40 minutes, got the pace back down to like closer to four minutes per k. Felt pretty strong, heart rate didn't go that high, lost a few places in the last couple of kilometers. I kind of, I was, the chimp brain was telling me to chase them, but the, the sensible brain was telling me it's not worth it. Um, I had no idea what places they were and if that threw me off the podium or not. But yeah, reasonably happy. I think I think I got everything out of me, if I'm honest, um, with regards to the race. I certainly couldn't. I think if I'd have pushed the run harder as the calf didn't get worse, I would have risked really buggering it up for, for Texas. And that's obviously the big goal. So yeah, across the finish line, pretty happy. Fenella had a decent day, like a solid day, led the swim, biked reasonably well. She didn't run to her potential as well. We actually only finished 40 odd seconds apart from each other, which is really spooky. So yeah, uh, all eyes on Texas now. Got another two, well, it's two weeks till race day, been in Texas a week now, certainly adjusting to the heat and humidity. Yeah, ready to, ready to give it a whirl. I'll talk about the calf, it, how it's recovered in the last week or where I'm at sort of thing uh, in a different video. But uh, spoiler alert, it's feeling pretty good. Uh, in terms of much better than what I thought it would be a week on. Any questions, any comments, drop them in the, in the comment section below. And uh, thanks for watching.